with writing science fiction in particular, something that I have really noticed with contemporary writers, like writers that write now and publish books now, is that they really have to go and paint the whole picture of their world for you. They have to paint the cityscapes. They have to paint for you how futuristic the technology is. They have to show you how things are working, what 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 the the, the mode of transportation is, how everything is holograms and, and everything is holographic and everything is so pristine and so nice. And I'm like, fine, tell me that. Like, I need to know that. I need to know that about your world. But I am fine with just a few sentences. Now, and if if you go beyond a few sentences, it has to be because of the character's reaction to the world. So, for instance, I never read this book, but I think it was the case with uh, Harry Potter. The reason why J.K. Rowling could describe Hogwarts for the first time with elaborate detail is because Harry Potter, the character we're following along with, he's seeing it for the first time. You know, he's he, this is all a marvel to him. So maybe if you are a character or you're following a character that goes into this beautiful science fiction world, then, OK, you have some liberty to to describe it a little more than a few sentences. But if you're actually if the character has been long established in the world and this is just their routine, there is absolutely no reason to go more than a few sentences, a few cues to say what this what this world looks like. It's only if the character is experiencing something new, um, even in their established world, even if, if, if there's something new to uh, experience, if there's something to uh, combat, if there's a conflict, and then it has to be descriptive. You know, if the character is undergoing something that is not their mundane or their routine, then I would say yes. The, the, the writer has a little bit more liberty to describe all that they're seeing. So I have my, my protagonist in my science fiction, um, the, there's a moment in even the first chapter, within the first few chapters, and they're short chapters, by the way, um, where she is beholding something of her city or outside her city for the first time. So she's used to what her city looks like or the district in her city looks like. And I don't go more than two sentences of so the reader knows, okay, this is what the place looks like. But then she has to travel over something. And because it's not really available to the modern day worker, like the average worker, like it's more accessible to the affluent, it's it's not commonplace for a normal, ordinary person to travel to. So she's seeing this for the first time and, and she beholds these things for the first time and she sees it with media. She'll see it with the news or, or sh maybe she'll see it with magazines or whatever, or maybe a video uh, of, of the place, but she's never experienced it firsthand what it looks like. Then for, for something for experience like that, where it's very new and awe-inspiring, that's where you can actually get a little descriptive. But when someone is doing their you know, everyday job. I don't think it makes sense in the, the, the narrative that the world is being described extensively if he's just going to his, his normal job every day. If it's part of your world, if it's part of your mundane, you really shouldn't go at lengths to describe it because the, the person you're following, the character you're, you're following, you know, with their perspective, they're not seeing it like that. There was one point in this excerpt where this guy, this this protagonist was describing all these like neuro holographic displays of stuff like, you know, ships and transportations and and um, shopping places and stuff like that. And the way the author was describing the technology was and we hadn't had this kind of technology a thousand years ago. And I'm like, OK, is that is that not having it a thousand years ago going to be significant in the future? Because why would you compare your technology from such a distant past if that past doesn't come back again? Now, I'm not saying literally like like time travel, but it's like, OK, if you haven't if, if the past is not as significant to the plot, why would you make that comparison? I think I think this is a, a trip, uh, a trip up or a, a misstep that science fiction writers of today, they, they they get caught off guard with with like, oh, we got to We got to compare our technology and our world building to modern day 2020 earth. <laughs>
I was like, you, you don't have to. And, and, and this kind of leads me to the, the other point I was thinking about was you really got to trust your readers. You got to trust the readership. If, if you have readers reading your science fiction, chances are maybe that's their first time reading science fiction. Maybe they're picking up a science fiction book for the first time, but chances are if you have readers for science fiction, they have read science fiction, or at the very least, they have seen science fiction. There's a plethora of sci-fi shows out there. Good, bad, subpar, great. There, we've had decades of science fiction shows. We have had decades of science fiction concept art. We've had decades of science fiction in games now, which means our sensibilities to what futuristic science fiction looks like is pretty high up there. Even if you're not an avid science fiction reader of any science fiction, classic or contemporary, most people understand what futuristic science fiction looks like having never read a book. So it doesn't really behoove the writer to go into crazy amount of detail about how futuristic this looks. There was even one point in the book where or in the excerpt that I was reading where it was like it, it was it was this sentence. It was the color scheme was gray and white. I mean, unless that's in contrast to something very important in the plot or the character's experience, I really didn't need to know that. I mean, maybe maybe walk into a, a, a dull, you know, you come from the outside and then it's dim with gray and low white light. And then I'll have it. But I don't have to actually know the color scheme. That's that's an interior decorator. It's like, and that's, that's the thing is like, I can almost see women falling into this trap if they write science fiction. Like, oh, we got to tell, talk about the color scheme. <clears throat> Maybe one or two color cues, like some something that I use for like morning light is like red gold for the morning light uh, in, in the city or fuchsia or amber for a sunset, like a beautiful sunset. But, but I don't go into great lengths of like, I have to describe. And, and actually, when after reading that excerpt, I went back to my manuscript. I'm like, okay, am I being too descriptive, you know, with my colors here? Um, so it was way too descriptive. And, and why I think that can slow the reader down now, the t today's reader of science fiction, is um, because people know what science fiction looks like. With, with this narrative in particular, with this one excerpt, it was, I've got to show you how cool my world looks. Now, yes, have that as a motive, but don't be so obvious about it. Like, just give me a few cues, do a few more paragraphs with the plot, with the char character's interiority if he's alone, have some action, and then a couple more cues of the description, and I'll be fine. And maybe I'm saying this, and maybe you guys disagree. Maybe I'm saying this because I already have a very active imagination. Like uh, we're reading Darth Plagueis. Um, Professor Geek is doing a book study with Big Al every Friday night. I really am enjoying Darth Plagueis. And you know what? They, he, the the author describes uh, Lu Luceno or Luceno. I forget the, the author's name. He describes places like the 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 Mune's world just, just so succinctly and so briefly. And... That's all I needed. I know what the world like looks like. Even if there's concept art out there that disagrees with my imagination, I know what the world looks like. It was that it was that way with the Thrawn trilogy. I knew what Kashik or Kashik looked like in the Thrawn trilogy based on some very important cues, descriptive cues or descriptors. And then I'm like, fine, that's all I need. Again, going back to the trap, that is where writers today say, no, I have, to, I have to show you how cool I can make this world. It's like, no, let the readers use their own imaginations. With classic science fiction, it's a different breed because they didn't have the media we have now. They didn't have the video games. They didn't have the, the modern day cinematography. They, especially in the 1920s and 30s, they had very little to work with. And it was the time when people read as a pastime. So you could actually like the the, the sci-fi writer of the 1920s and 30s, for instance, or or someone like H.G. Wells could really actually divulge a little bit more in the description because there were really it was a limited arsenal of 
sci-fi media back then, even in the Pulp Fiction, you know, even with the magazines and stuff in the 1950s, there was still some limit to what the public had access to with, with modern day public online access. Like we, we could just type in a few things and then we are just showered by gorgeous, gorgeous, um, sci-fi concept art and stuff like that.